Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Get Jash, the first one back for 2022. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have Dr. Alexis Rose join me today for this first episode back. So Dr. Alexis is a highly trained embodiment coach. Her experience lies in relationship dynamics, subtle energy and spiritual development. She's a certified heart-centered hypnotherapist and specializes in childhood trauma, addiction and breaking generational patterns. So her clients feel empowered to create shifts in their life and business by strengthening their inner resources, feeling safe in their body and trusting their intuitive guidance. When she's not with her clients, she spends time walking in nature, doing yoga, yay, um, and enjoying time with her niece and nephew and currently lives in Florida and loves all things Disney and Harry Potter, of which I just finished a rewatch of. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining me because as I was kind of gushing to you before we started recording I learned so much about you when you kind of came into my world through the love vibe and thought flow facilitator program that I did last year and for those of you who who were who are probably new to to Dr Alexis as well this woman can just like just riff and wax lyrical around trauma and cultural competency and embodiment and just lay the facts and it just speaks to my my nerdy nerdy heart about it so thank you so much for joining me and for for giving us your time here today I'm really grateful I, I'm so honored I'm like a nerd in myself <laughs> and I love talking about these things so I'm very excited to be here today oh, yay so I'm let's bring it back to like the word itself so for those of you uh, for those who might have only heard of the word trauma on like Instagram how would you describe it in a nutshell because it's a bit of a loaded question but in a nutshell how would you describe trauma to someone who's like what do you mean well I think you know the first thing that I always talk about when it comes to trauma is that it occurs on a spectrum so there's mm -hmm. like low grade trauma and there's high grade trauma and basically whether it's low or high grade it's the occurrence of an event that elicits a certain emotion and a response and reaction from your body something that completely impacts you in the way that you think that you behave and that you move and navigate life afterwards and so sometimes if it's a low-grade trauma then it's something that has like a very small impact and you could probably just you know, not deal with it and be okay. But if it starts to compound, you have like a bunch of little things, then it makes a much bigger impact. And then we have the high grade trauma, which a lot of more people are aware of, which you can get chronic PTSD or PTSD afterwards from experiencing it. So it has a much greater impact on how onto your body, your mind and how you respond afterwards. Mm, yeah. And I, I like that explanation as well, because um, I think sometimes there's the idea that like people can just change their mind and make a decision and then it goes away it's like you know it's, it's not it's not necessarily a decision that's being made um, I think the decision maybe lies in once there is awareness of to do to do work and to find like safe healing spaces for it but it doesn't like it's not like an immediate difference because it does live in our bodies it is like this this cellular reaction almost right of of things that we might not even be aware of 100 percent, because you know there's there's trauma all around us so people will say that they've never experienced trauma in their life but the reality is every person on this planet has experienced trauma because we have generational trauma through family that is passed down through dna then we also have societal trauma, collective trauma. I mean, the time that we're living in right now, everyone is living in a very traumatic time at this point in history. And so everyone is experiencing some type of reaction mm -hmm. to what we are living through at this time. And then there's individual trauma, your personal trauma that you are experiencing through events in your own life. So how you choose to respond to things is helpful however when you have experienced so much trauma then your ability to respond starts to get hindered and then you just start to have an automatic reaction because mm -hmm. your nervous system gets activated and you just go into like 
one of many different directions, which is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode. And then that elicits a certain reaction from you. So when you're aware that you have trauma, you can either ignore it and try to keep pushing through, right? It's that survival instinct. I'm just going to keep pushing Mm. through it. Or when you start dealing with it, you recognize, okay, I have this specific reaction that happens when something activates my nervous system, but I'm not going to go through with that. I'm going to find a different pathway. And Mm. that's really the journey for someone who's healing from trauma. Mm. Yeah. And it's, and it is a journey, right? Like it's, it's, Mm. it's not this, this immediate turnaround, um, whether it's based on decision or not, like it's, it's this whole thing with the difference when you talk about, um, was it low grade and high grade that you spoke of? Is that like little T and big T trauma that that we hear of? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. And I just use low grade to high grade because it's just, I always look at it on a spectrum from low to Mm. high. So, but it's the same thing as little T and big T for sure. Yeah. And, and, I think that's the the misunderstanding around trauma that people tend to have as well. Like they they may look only at like the the high grade traumas, the big T's, and go like, well, I haven't been to war, or I haven't, you know, like had. Obviously, there's a disclaimer on this whole episode. <laughs> it'll be it'll be in the caption and show notes. But like, I haven't had you know like this horrific violation experience, or you know like anything like that that would be in those higher things, but what do you what would you say to people who kind of dismiss their own lower grade traumas because they're not the the big things that we hear about the most famous example I always use for like little t's or low grade trauma is like being a three-year-old in Walmart with your parents and they leave you alone for five minutes and you have no Mm -hmm. idea where your parent is And in that moment, those five minutes for that three-year-old is absolute panic because they think that they're alone. They think they did something wrong. They have no idea like what's happening. And those five minutes drag on to feel like five hours. Parent comes back, kids like, oh my gosh, like how, like, I don't understand. Like I was just abandoned. And that's what it feels like. And Mm. that small window of abandonment if there are similar instances like that throughout that individual's life, then that one experience of abandonment is going to grow to this big thing. Yeah. And I think I'm glad that you're bringing this up because I think a lot of people misunderstand what to treat when it comes to trauma. And they start focusing, like you said, on the the bigger T's, the high grade trauma and the things that are so in your face. Mm. But when you start looking at that and you really start working through it, what you recognize is it's not those big, huge obstacles that are, you know, creating these significant reactions in your life. It is the smaller, the Mm -hmm. lower grade things that you are actually struggling with on a day-to-day basis. Anyone can see a boulder and be like, oh, gotta avoid that. But Mm. who's looking for the pebble? Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, is that when you start recognizing that the whole journey of trauma healing is not about eliminating trauma, the trauma already happened. There's no elimination of it or the experience of it. What you're actually working on healing is the intensity and the frequency of when your body gets activated from the memory of it. And so if all you're doing is focusing on the bigger trauma, then you're missing out all those experiences when something small happens that sends you off the rails. Yeah. And so it's almost like what, what is more useful, useful to be focused on is the dysregulation rather than the trauma itself. Exactly. And Mm. that's why so many people have stopped I won't say stop. Let me reframe. (laughs) They have decreased in attending talk therapy because Mm. talk therapy is re-traumatizing because in talk therapy, they're having you relive the trauma by speaking about it. Whereas now we've seen this big, big shift where now everyone's talking about trauma. Everyone's talking about Mm. embodiment. 
And the point of that is because collectively the world is starting to see that the future of being able to move in a day-to-day function that is balanced and in harmony in life means having a regulated nervous system. Mm-hmm means that you can look at your nervous system and be able to breathe, be able to move through the emotions, to experience emotions, no matter how heightened it is, and move through it by feeling it versus avoiding it, numbing it out, repressing it, and all those other self-sabotage ways. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It And... You just speak in my language. Um, I'm just like, yes, praise. Um, the it it can sneak up on you as well. Like there have been moments where I've recognized this, and it's this bodily reaction to something that you normally might not be reacted to. So like it could happen in a relationship breakdown, right? Where mm-hmm. something that made you feel safe, maybe it was like affectionate touch, like anchoring or something like that, that made you feel really safe and co-regulated in the moment. If someone else who is loving, who is a friend, you know, like, or after the fact comes and, you know, does that same thing to you, I call it spikiness. It's like immediately, like the spikes are out and you're like, oh, that's a reaction. Like that's a, whoo. And, and it's such a subtle thing, but it's, it's, it's this, it really is this felt sense, like this, this sense memory and this, this bodily reaction, because we can logic our way through anything Mm -hmm. we choose to really. And, and going back to your example of the three-year-old, like as adults, we can be like, oh, well, of course they, like, I wasn't being abandoned at three years old, but that's saying it with probably a little, at least more of a fully formed prefrontal cortex, you know, like reasoning and like, and, and a fully formed brain or again at least more formed brain than a three-year-old so like it doesn't matter if we can reason it away now if the experience was what the experience was in the moment Mm -hmm. whether it's as a three-year-old or in a like I think relationship breakdown trauma even if it wasn't an abusive relationship is is um not acknowledged as much as it could be it's like oh just get over it again or other things it's just just a lot of just get over it just get over it just get over it rather than okay and what (laughs) like because we can yeah we can reason ourselves through anything with with the the gift of a formed brain and and hindsight (laughs) well it's a it's a survival technique right so Mm. It's, 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 again, your, your body goes either into sympathetic shock, which is we are going to just rush through this. We're just going to move through this bulldoze through it, no matter what, mm. or it goes to parasympathetic shock where you get paralyzed. You can't do anything. You just like are stuck in that moment. And so using the example that you gave, what is being activated in that moment is not the trauma, but the body memory of it. Yeah. And that can happen at any time, which is why when we talk about the, you know, trauma being stored in the body, that is why so many people are looking to now do somatic work because you have to release the trauma from the body in order to be able to respond in a different way. If you're logically trying to decide, okay, I'm going to think this new way, I'm going to choose to behave this new way but you haven't released the trauma from your body, then when you encounter something that activates the nervous system in a very similar fashion, all that stuff is going to come up again, which is why I always tell people that affirmations are only going to get you so far. My like yeah. mindset is only going to get you so far. And actually the mindset work comes after doing the somatic work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's something over the last few years I've, I've sort of learned as well, because I'm a very like cognitive person by, by nature, like for whatever reason, depending on what you look into with it, but like just by nature, I'm a very cognitive person. And, and that's been my big challenge as well. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out the answers always. And, Mm -hmm. and over the last few years is recognizing like, oh, mindset is important. 
and I need to make decisions of when is enough or when is whatever and you know like to get myself out of you know certain situations that may not be serving me or whatever it is but but exactly what you just said is like that almost comes after the the embodiment or the somatic work of it where it's like there might be a decision beforehand to be like oh I'm gonna change role like change this I'm gonna leave this job or whatever it is the thing that's a decision but the rest comes after because you've got to you've got to believe it in your body and you can't tell yourself to believe it in your body it comes after because you have to move that energy out of your body to make space for what it is that you want to start embodying Mm. so like it doesn't make sense we'll just keep going with the example of the abandonment because we've already used it yeah it's a great example if, if the thought now is like oh I'm recognizing that I'm sabotaging my relationships because I always feel like I'm going to be abandoned and you just sit there and you say well I choose to be in relationships that are loving and caring and supportive. You may already have those relationships, but your body and your nervous system is not relaxed enough to be fully present in those relationships, which then sabotages it and pushes people away versus bringing them closer. And so if I'm pushing people away in relationship, even though I'm saying I want to be in a healthy and supportive relationship, it goes against each other and it like Mm -hmm. null and voids it. Whereas if you identify where in your body are you feeling that abandonment, where can you move that energy out of your body and shake it out or, you know, really do any type of somatic work. There's lots of somatic work to be done, but doing any form of somatic work to move that energy out of your body and then reclaim what was lost. Because in that moment, that three-year-old lost something. They either Mm -hmm. lost their confidence, they lost their sense of power, they lost their connection, they lost their trust of people, whatever it is, they lost something in that moment. So you have to do the energetic work to move out the energy you don't want, reclaim what you lost, and then say, okay, now this is how I want my relationships to go. And then every thought and decision and choice you make goes into embodying that new relationship. (sighs) Yes. Yeah. And, and before we do that work as well, it's almost like we're creating an incongruence. If we're constantly going, I'm going to have loving, like connected and stable relationships, but our body is not in that space or it's holding on to, or it's just living in, in the energy of abandonment or like the story of like there's it's, it's an incongruence. It can't match rather than just sort of meshing. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, there's, it's an incongruence and there's also, it's like, you're naturally creating was resistance yeah. in the energy. It's like, I want to move forward, but the energy is coming back at me. So mm-hmm. if the energy is not flowing in the direction that you wanted to go, because you are actively maintaining the, the trauma energy, mm-hmm. there's, there's nowhere for it to go. Oh, yeah. I'm it's, I'm just having like these sort of connection points as well as you're talking because it reminds me and it links to one of my favorite quotes from you is I am not stuck the energy in my body is stuck so it then connects like and I I have used that so many times with myself and also just as a reminder with the people around me as well like well you know like Dr Alexis says this but but it also it then gives you a decision of what to focus on because when we can feel stuck or like we're in resistance it can feel like the world or the universe or God or whatever like is against us right like and you hear it a lot like people are like oh life is just shit or life is you know like whatever it is it's like okay I you're feeling resistance like I've been there oh my god I've been there like you know you're feeling resistance but it's almost like this clarity of oh where's the incongruence in me rather than trying to fix the world externally or or fight against it or bash it or you know like go like well why isn't it like you know why isn't it working for me or why you know why am I the victim or why 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 and go oh what like not why but like what is it that isn't feeling is do you think like isn't feeling safe to to sort of be with what the thought process wants it to be or it could be anything right I think it could be a couple of different things but going with what you're saying is that if you 
you know, let me back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking about the energy being mm-hmm. stuck, right? And not you as a person being stuck. If yeah. the energy is going in a loop and, and the energy and everyone has a pattern, you know, I, I like to frame it in that way. We have a pattern, um, particularly in relationships. And mm-hmm. there, the, no matter what the relationship is, whether it's with uh, a coworker, a boss, a friend, a significant other, it goes in the same direction because that's the pattern that has been created. It's just the pathway, right? So if you're looking at the pathway in your relationship and it's always going like this happens, then this happens. And like, you can predict what Mm. is going to happen. That's a pattern. The more that you engage in that pattern, it becomes a construct. It completely becomes the way that you, you are as a person in any relationship, it is ingrained in you. And so in order to stop that construct from essentially ruling what you're doing, on top of regulating the nervous system, it's creating a different pathway, a different flow for energy to move. Mm -hmm. And you do that by outlining, I usually break it down with my clients where I do a visual with them and we like break it down into a circle of what the behaviors are and then Mm -hmm. show them, okay, so if you exited here, what would the behavior be? And then Mm -hmm. they'll identify it. And then now we create a new pathway okay, so you, you, you got out, that was the behavior. What's the next step after that? The next step after that. And the next step after that, this is your new construct. This is your new way of being. And so when pe- when people are feeling like, and I've been there, I, I get, and we all do, no matter how far oh, along yeah. you are, you're going to get there. You're always going to be in a place of like, crap. Like, I feel like the universe is against me. Like what is happening? This is happening to me. It's not happening for me. I've lost faith. And what you learn, the more that you practice, and it's a practice because no one's going to be perfect, is that when you step out of that energy, take a step back and you observe it, you observe the pattern, the construct for what it is, then it allows you to see, oh, I've been doing the same thing over and over and over again. Why do I keep doing that? Okay, I need to do something different. And then you do the thing that's different and you stick on that path and that naturally changes the energy. And then it starts to feel in flow because you're going down a different pathway. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just keep doing the same things over and over again, well, now I'm stuck in that cycle and I'm not getting out of that cycle. I'm not. Yeah but just keep choosing to do the same thing over and over again. And linking back to what you were saying before is like, that's victim. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that you're in a pattern and you have a construct that is within your your mind and you you feel like you can't break it. Even though you know there are other options out there. (laughs) That's the difference. If you are unaware and you are stuck in the cycle, I totally get someone being like, oh yeah against me. I'm stuck in it. I'm not going to get out. It is when you become aware that there's other options available to you, but you choose to keep doing the same thing that is victim. Oh yeah. And I love that clarification too, because like I've been there before where I'm like, but it just keeps happening. I'm choosing differently. And I'm asking, you know, like, but I think it's let me know your thoughts on this because I think it's almost like we try to oversimplify like in relational patterns using that example right be like well you know like I I did things differently and I sort of I I waited or I did this or that or I asked questions it's like it's not so much like that still feels external facing rather than what did you do to recollect or just keep your energy hold like holding your energy in you rather than you know like and it could just be something simple like that um simple but 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 not simple because we try to simplify it in other ways of going like you know you hear like relationship advice for example it's just the the one that you see the most of they're like well you know like wait until the third or the fifth date or whatever it is or like you know what whatever the advice is and they're like and then it will change the pattern for you it's like well no because it feels like it's it's trying to oversimplify it from the external but changing that cycle may not even look different externally it it just may feel different internally is that right like is that do you think 
Yes. And I'm going to take what you're saying a step further and expand Please do. on it. <laughs> yeah. And so what you're brilliantly talking about is co-regulation. And people have a very large misunderstanding of what co-regulation actually mm -hmm. means. Right now, the biggest thing that people are talking about is we need to co-regulate by calibrating to other people's energy. That is false. That mm -hmm. is codependency. That is people pleasing. That is reinforcing self-sabotage relationship patterns. Mm -hmm. And so what you're speaking to, which is really brilliant, is you have to go within and you have to look at what are your patterns? What are you responsible for? What are your thoughts, your actions that you completely alone are responsible for? What is the energy that you want to bring to the relationship, regardless of who it is that you're in relationship with? Mm -hmm. Because if you bring you wherever you go, then people are going to respond to that the same way that you're putting out. But if we're going around and being in relationship with people by trying to calibrate to who they are, mm -hmm. you're not bringing your authentic self to the relationship. And that relationship is not going to work because it's not in harmony and it's not in balance. Instead, there is a imbalance because you're trying to be something that you're not versus naturally being who you are, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about energy and frequency. Yeah. And I think like I wanted to bring that in also when you brought up like the relationship cycles of any kind of relationship is because it can feel like there's so much um almost blame whether it's self or or placed upon of like well you just didn't do this or you're just doing this it's like well I want I deeply want to change that narrative for people or the understanding for people because it's it's not it's not about the it's not about the external facing or like you know it's really is it comes back to you it comes back to not blame but it's like maybe the decisions you made weren't wrong for that relationship or whatever it was. Maybe it's just about how, how did you feel and how do you regulate and, and how do you make sure that you hold all of that? Like, it's just, it changes the blame, which I feel like helps shift almost additional trauma from potentially happening of like going, well, I just keep doing the wrong thing. And, oh, I, I'm the one that's wrong all the time. It's like, maybe you weren't, maybe you showed up fully maybe it was them, maybe it was, you know what I mean? Like, maybe it was just stuff that you don't even know and you didn't do anything wrong. Like, it's just, there's so much that we place on ourselves in, in all of this too, right? Yeah, and that's why it's so important to make sure that you know who you are and what you're bringing to the relationship, regardless what the relationship is labeled as. Because mm. if you're bringing, we'll keep on again with this, you know, um, pattern of abandonment. If someone is knowingly yeah. going into a relationship, knowing that they have a pattern, a cycle of abandonment, and that means initially they're going to do whatever it is their partner wants so that they don't, mm. they, they don't get abandoned. But then when that doesn't feel safe enough, because they're never going to really feel safe in that they're going to start to pull away, right? They're going to do everything at first to make sure the partner is like in love with them and obsessed and infatuated. And it's like, oh, okay, this person really cares about me. And then they're going to wait for the other shoe to drop because that's what mm. always happens. And so yep. when they start to have the anxiety of the other shoe is going to drop, you will see them start to back away. And that push and then pull in the dynamic of the relationship that they are putting just individually themselves, not even looking into what their partner is doing, that is already <laughs> going to offset the balance that's in the relationship. And so when we talk about being in relationship with others, it's really about holding yourself accountable for your choices and your actions and taking 100% personal responsibility, not owning or trying to rescue or save anybody, not trying to blame or shame the other person, because that's the other thing that happens in relationships. Mm -hmm. People really don't want to, you know, take responsibility for the shit that's happening. They want to blame and shame the other person. And especially when there's trauma involved, you know, everybody's bringing something to the table. And so if it's unresolved trauma that's sitting on the table, 
then there are lots of things that are going to happen in that relationship. Mm. Yeah. And that's just, that's just the trauma of like our own lifetimes that you mentioned at the beginning. And I wanted to go into this a little bit, or at least a little bit, (laughs) a lot, if you want, like about generational and ancestral trauma, because you spoke a lot about like cultural competency and the trainings that I've done with you as well. And that I know that there's a lot of layers in that, (laughs) even just in, in the words that I've just used there, but, um, as a start, like how, how, what could that be in terms of helping people understand what that is? Well, I think, you know, the easiest way to dip our toe, our, our toe in that big pool is <laughs> it's a huge pool. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge pool. So we're going to go into the shallow end, right? And so mm-hmm. by stepping into the shallow end and stepping right into where the little steps are with the, with the, you know, going yeah, down the safety bit. yeah yeah the little safety zone is you're going to start with your family of origin your immediate nuclear family of origin what are the patterns that you know about relationships and what is passed down in your family because if you can start looking at your family's relationship patterns you can see okay here's where i picked up this here's where i picked up that and then start to, you know, reframe and rewire your neural pathways so that you're not repeating those, those patterns. And that um, particularly, especially if it's going to be parenting, right? You, want, you don't want to go and just do the opposite end of the spectrum because you're just going to get a whole nother set of problems, right? It's, and that's almost a trauma response in itself, isn't it? Like sort of going, well, I'm going to do the opposite of what my parents did. Cause it's yeah. like, that's still I'm never going to be like my parents. I'm going to do the complete opposite of what they did. Mm. And that's great. And that's fine. Until you create a whole nother set of problems that you're like, oh, I didn't even realize I was creating these generational patterns. And, mm. and that's why going to the extreme is never the right answer. It's all about being able to find balance which is not the same as perfection. It's about finding a middle ground, finding balance in what it is that Mm. you want your relationships to look like, knowing that you can ask for you want, you can ask for what you want, knowing that you might not get it in a relationship. Mm. And so when you start looking at your immediate nuclear family, that's all right, okay, there's a lot of depression, anxiety, there's a lot of substance use, there's, you know, different types of addictions. You naturally want to start there because if you can start with the addictions, then that tells you what are some of the self-sabotage patterns that you yourself hold. And you can start reframing that. That's more about personal responsibility while also using your family of origin as a map. And then Mm. if you want to get even deeper into that, past the addictions and really look at just like, relationship dynamics as a whole, that's where you start to then go further up to other generations. That's when you start to look at, okay, um, on my mom's side, here was a major theme that got passed down. Maybe a major theme that got passed down was mental health challenges. Mm. Maybe a major theme that got passed down on my dad's side was, um, every single marriage ended in divorce. On my mom's side, every single um, eldest child never got married, Mm. right? You start to really break things down where it's like, oh, okay, I can see by looking at them and really just studying their life. Okay, they went through that their parent went through that, that parent went through, and you start to see what really got brought down each generation. And Mm -hmm. that helps you to do more of ancestral healing work because you're using your ancestors as a way to not only work through your own challenges that you're experiencing in the present, but you're also giving them an opportunity to heal by moving through it. And then setting this pathway for the future that is saying, we're not going to go through that anymore. Yeah. Because is it with, with generational trauma, it's, I feel like I've read research that it, you 
it goes back, like it can impact us from seven generations back or something mm-hmm. like more than what we would expect. Like it's not just our parents or our grandparents or the ones we've met or the ones that have met the ones we've met. It's the, it goes back like seven generations. And when yep. you think about seven generations ago, all of the trauma, again, coming back to collective trauma that's happened because of events in the world, let alone personal lives. There's mm-hmm. a lot that's carried with, with that through the bodies, through the decisions, through the, the ways of being that lead to to you now also so it's it's not it's not like it's something that's to be dismissed almost like it's like oh yeah that was just a whatever it's like a no well like you know there was a parent like there were a set of whatever great grandparents that lived through the great depression or like you know that or, or further than that like you know civil wars or like whatever it is like there's a lot that exactly yeah. And, th- and that's where you look at it, where it's not just, okay, we're looking at mental health or addiction or anything like that. It would be the same mm. as if, you know, twins ran in your family. You would know mm. who had the twins. Yeah. So you know, you would want to know, like, hey, is it coming for <laughs> yeah. me? <laughs> yeah. Because, right? like, it normally jumps. It's like, oh, shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, you're like, okay, it's always this person in the generation. Mm. So you want to know. And it'll teach you. And I think that you're bringing up a really great point of how it extends to then cultural and societal impact as well, because there Mm. are things that are happening in the world. Like right now, there's a lot happening in the world that is going to impact future, that is impacting generations now, but is going to impact future generations because Mm. of how we're responding to things at this moment. And when you're able to take in the information without absorbing it but Mm. just being aware of it and then making decisions based on what feels right for you that's where you start to see like okay this is this is how we move forward because at the end of the day our ancestors made decisions based off of what they felt was right for them in that moment and they didn't have all the resources that we have now and so For us to have the resources that we have to be so aware, it's not just enough to have awareness. It's also about taking action. And so Mm. it's really important for people who have the awareness that are doing this work to then follow through with the actions. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Because otherwise that's where we just step into the living the story of, it's almost like, we can get attached to like the story of the trauma, like, oh, my, my family have this and, I, and, and you're kind of like holding this grip on it. So it's like, this must happen to me. And it may not be something you really want to, but if we're caught up in the story and believing and, and almost attaching our identity to the story, it's self-fulfilling prophecy also, right? Like it's. Yeah. Because that's what happens is that the narrative, the family story, as you're saying, has been so ingrained and passed down Mm. that people are accepting it to be truth. And Mm. they're automatically saying there's nothing, it's it's very much um, an ingrained victim mindset and almost even an inherited victim mindset because it's like, this thing always happens. Like we can use money as an example, like, okay, my family has always been in poverty and this is what, you know, I'm always going to be in poverty. And that might not be true for that person. That person could have Mm so much in their you know their human design their chart all these things that says that they're going to be super successful and you know and very you know prosperous but because they are subscribing to this narrative that says that they come from a family that doesn't have a lot of money Mm. then they're they're going to continue to behave in that way which is why it's important to do the work because even though a lot of people are focused on, okay, these are all the bad things that my family passed down to me. They're not looking at the strengths that their family passed down to them. And that's really mm. the legacy is what are the strengths that were passed down that we want to expand on? Mm. Yeah. And that sort of leads me into the next bit, like about prevent almost um, preventative measures in a way. I'll explain that. But like, But when we're so focused on like the past or the trauma or the, again, the story or the whatever, we kind of forget what we can do now. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of having a conversation around, um, oh God, how do I put it? (laughs) 
like we were having a conversation before we started recording around like when you're in in uh, roles or careers or professions like military for example where you're creating this survival mechanism because there it, it's required almost required of with the job in order to to carry out your role or your job but at what point does that sort of does working on that begin to help or hinder surviving in the role itself and a lot of what I teach is um I call it like stress regulation rather than stress management or whatever it is anymore but like it's really around how do we regulate ourselves now to almost I don't want to say this as a as a blanket as a as a definitive but almost like to the more we practice breathing and being in our body now is is there any um I guess probably I'll word it as a question is there any proof that that can help with the impact of trauma ongoing also and I mean that's a huge conversation in itself like all of this is a big conversation potentially they could go off in any branch but yeah, yeah. I think you know what I want to say about that is that the more that an individual, and this is this is just my opinion, my belief system, is that the more an individual focuses on doing the somatic work, the mm-hmm. less likely they are to have a, a break in their psyche, right? Mm, and that's a great way to put it, yeah. And the reason I say that is because, you know, if people just keep pushing through, keep pushing through, keep pushing through, we know that trauma will impact them in a way where if their thoughts aren't enough to stop them, then physically they will be stopped. And so they'll be put in, um, there will be situations where like they'll get sick or they'll end up in the hospital Mm -hmm. or, or stuff like that because their body is trying to tell them what they're doing is not mm-hmm. in their best interest. It's not in their highest good. And then their body's trying to stop them from going down that same mm-hmm. path. And so someone who's aware of those things and they are in a job, like a first responder where they have to be in these like highly stressful situations and high pressure situations, them doing the work is a benefit because it maintains their mm-hmm. sanity first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Um, but number two, it teaches them how to move through activations in their nervous system. It teaches them how to not to expect to be perfect all the time, where it's either at a hundred or zero that does not Mm -hmm. exist. It has never existed for anyone. And the desire to maintain that is impossible. And what we're really working with individuals on is being able to maintain status quo yeah going the little waves the little waves right it's the same uh, I compare it to the heartbeat all the time because when your heartbeat Mm -hmm. is steady it's still going up and down it's not until something like really drastic happens that it starts spiking up and down right and so what we're trying to do and and what we're helping individuals to do particularly first responders is to make sure that they're going they're stopping the erratic right we're decreasing the intensity and the frequency of the activations that they experience in their body we're not taking them Mm -hmm. away that's impossible what we want to do is decrease how often and how severe they are And I think that's the major difference in how we're doing somatic work with individuals now and in the future. Yeah, definitely. And I want to point out also, like we use first responders and military as the example of the extreme, because we can all kind of see how that plays out and why, like the examples that we're using in that, but it is important, like it's useful for anyone no matter your role you could be in the most mundane role like or it could be like what feels mundane but you know it could be anything it doesn't you don't have to be in those oh yeah extreme situations to benefit it's just as important for someone who's a teacher or someone who's working oh yeah a corporate nine to five right you have high pressure situations you're Mm -hmm. under deadlines you have to make curriculums you have to like be in front of a lot of people and be able to speak to them 
and express your point of view you have to respond to authority you have to like have people respond to you it's Mm. a lot of those situations is really about learning how to co-regulate where it's like you're not going to be afraid to speak up and say what it is that you need to say to make sure that you're getting what it is that you need yeah or it could be for someone living through a global pandemic Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it's literally for all of us and um I wanted to ask as well because I I mean I know this from previous sessions I've been in with you but like there's a use of the word trigger versus activation that you taught me almost a year ago now. So I, I really brought that into like my vernacular where I'm like, it's activated. And, and I get the question of like, what do you mean by activated? Because people associate it with trigger instead. How for, for those playing at home, how, like, why is language important in, in that way? I think language is important because if we can talk about things in a way that is relatable to people, then they're more likely to accept it because they understand it. I think there are lots of buzzwords that come across in our world and regardless, you know, what your position, right? Like surviving a pan, a global pandemic, being in a yeah. nine to five, being a teacher, being a first responder, being a coach, whatever it is that you're doing in the world, if we're talking about trauma and everyone's just saying trigger, like the word trigger triggers people. (laughs) Like Mm. it just, but it's also talking about the external. It's still talking about the external factor rather than the acknowledgement of what's happening internally. Exactly. Because it's putting it on the other person versus Mm. saying, Hey, what's happening within me, which is why I have always liked using the word activation because If something happens in my environment, I become aware, I become activated about it. There's a, and there's a, some type of reactivity happening in my nervous system. That's what needs to be addressed. Not what's happening outside Mm -hmm. of me, what's happening within me, because we can't control what's going to happen outside of us. We can't control other people. What we can do is maintain how we respond to our external situations. So I say activate and I use that word because it's a reminder for me and for all the people that I work with of like, pay attention to what's happening to you. What are Mm -hmm. you experiencing in this moment? What needs to be addressed so that you can move through this moment in a less heightened state? Yeah, because I think a lot of what people think um, trauma management is also is, is avoiding the triggers or like you know trying to make the triggers go away because the triggers are the moments the things that maybe like you know are the catalyst for the activation but we can't control the triggers like you said like whether it's from another person or whether it's a smell or whether it's a a, some kind of sensory experience like that happens from external we can't control any of that like we could see something or hear a song and you know whatever it is but it's not about control. It's not about control at all. It's about regulation and recognizing the dysregulation, which is all the activation here. I keep, I keep right. touching, like for those, for those who yeah. are just listening to the, to the podcast, <laughs> I keep, I keep touch whenever I'm talking about here or like in the body, like I, my hand keeps going to like my heart or like my gut. Like it's like, it's, it's mm-hmm. this in the body feeling. So. Okay. So do you want to know why you do that though? Yeah, tell, tell me, like, I, th- I think I'm going to okay. tell us so why. <laughs> the reason that, and this, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing because you do it so like unknowingly, but you also see like coaches talk about this from a very like superficial standpoint. The reason that people talk about putting their hand on their heart or they naturally gravitate put, to putting their hand on their heart is because the front and the back of your heart is the best way to regulate your nervous system when you put when you put a slight touch there you're putting pressure on the nervous system to soothe it automatically Mm. and so that like releases some of the the stress that's happening and it naturally starts to like fizzle away Mm. it's a form it's a way yeah it's a form and it's a way to regulate the nervous system without going to other things it's like a quick thing to do in the moment and Mm. very effective 
And it's yeah. something very simple that you can do in the moment, like I said, that will work. And mm. I think that the other piece to this too is that when so many people are trying to like avoid and control their triggers or their activations, it's avoidance of the self. Mm -hmm. And so the more that you can connect to yourself and the more that you can be present in your own body, the easier it's going to be to navigate life and the, mm -hmm. the circumstances of life. Because at the end of the day, you may be aware of trauma that you have experienced, but we all have body memories of trauma that we do not remember as well. Mm -hmm. You know, some people have birth trauma that they don't remember. And, but something happens, like you were saying earlier, someone touches them and it's like, oh, that comes up again, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not about the external whatsoever. It's about being able to hold space for yourself mm -hmm. and then giving people permission to be there to witness that also. I feel like doing that, um, I've taught this in from different lenses, like different examples, but I feel like doing that creates more empathy as well. And it's more emotional intelligence because like something I've, I've really honed in on my practice, like more consciously lately is like, just going like, oh, what is it that I need? Or like, you know, when I find that my, my head is trying to figure things out or whatever, even if it's not necessarily an activation, it's just life. Um, <laughs> like I'm like, oh, okay oh, I'm very like out there. I need to, you know, and I'll, and I'll just sort of be like, all right. So what are the feelings in me? And it feels counterintuitive to someone who's very heady to be like, well, I'm trying to solve all of my problems and I can't do that because like without being up here in my head, I need like, you know, like it, it feels counterintuitive because it's like, but that's not answering the question, but it is because it's shifting your energy and it's, and it's creating this connection with self. And then it actually, for me it, it shifts the heightenedness of the experience too like it's just sort of makes you go oh okay I can breathe I can cool maybe I just need to breathe <laughs> like you know it's just yeah it's this it's this whole thing of of the relationship with self um I, I said something that I was going to lead into with this but like it is it's this whole it's this whole thing of like where where is the relationship with self and where are we building this this safer relationship here hand on heart like you know here with self that that kind of just makes everything else e easier in a way even when it's not easy like or even when it's not smooth it's it's we come from this more whole connected place so when we relate to other people it's from that place that that shifts the sometimes the trajectory of the outcome of the conversation depending on you know what kind of conversation it is or whatever it is it's just it's this different energy in how we show up and it gives people permission to do the same I think that's where I was going with that like the, the empathy and the, the we recognize that oh if I need this because I've taught it around boundaries and asking for your needs like you know like where it's like well if you recognize and acknowledge that you have boundaries and have needs it's easier to recognize that other people will have boundaries and needs that may be different, but it's this empathy. It's the same thing. If you have this connection with yourself, it's easier to recognize, you know, like other people and their connection and, and not feel like it's all personal to you. Yeah. Because what's happening in that moment is you're creating space for something different mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. By, by taking a pause, right? By like, again, stepping back and saying, mm. okay, I'm not gonna try to force myself to overthink through this situation because the op there, there's like, I love people who are very intellectual and logical. It is when we go into excess mm. that then there's a dysregulation there. The yeah. same with feeling. You know, people can feel their feelings, but if they're going into excess, then mm. there's a dysregulation there and the opposite of thinking is feeling. And so if you're mm. in overdrive with your thinking, that's a, that's like a warning to take a step back and step into feeling. Yeah. 
and and it goes the other way too I feel like also because because yeah. I, I as you were saying I'm like yeah it's the people who are like only trying to feel and it's like but I just need you to connect up here for as well like mm-hmm. for a moment and just see like you know maybe there's logic that just makes everything a lot easier or whatever it is it's such a balance and it's the congruence and it's this I just saw it as like this almost like that in that polarity wave like the infinity symbol just like moving through and going yep up and then down but it's all connected and it's all regulated it feels like as I was like sort of feeling to like yeah that's regulation oh I can breathe like it's just this exactly yeah because someone who's like overly stimulated and they're overly Mm. emotional they got to take a step back and they have to think okay what's going on why am I reacting this way Mm. and when they stop and they think about it they're like oh okay that makes sense then they can choose something different yeah. Right. So on both, like you're saying, it is, it is this beautiful infinity symbol because you're at the end of the day, you're both stopping to regulate. And what mm-hmm. we're creating is balance and harmony between thinking and feeling it's. Yeah. United. Uh, I could talk for like hours with you about this, but um, <laughs> this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I, I already feel like I'd love to ask you to come back for a part two at some point because it's just like, oh, it's just, it's so important for people to be aware of regardless of like, you don't have to be a yoga teacher. So if you are definitely please be aware of it, but like, you know, you don't have to be a yoga teacher or a coach or a quote unquote leader. You, I think this is just this human experience of relating to each other that is so useful to have this awareness of, of, of this deeper thing that's going on but also for your for our own selves too so thank you so much for sharing some of your wisdom and and gifts and and all of it with us um where can people find you and your work or follow you and your work uh so thank you first and foremost so grateful to be here and to have had this conversation And I, the one thing I want to leave with before I give my information is that this work, I really want to emphasize what you said. This work is for everyone because this is how we move from an I focused society to a we focused society and really start to heal as a collective, which is what we need right now. We need more togetherness versus separation. And so this work and this invitation is for everyone. That's what I want to say. And then, um, (laughs) If you want to, um, you know, send me questions or follow me or anything, you can follow me on Instagram at uh, Dr. Alexis Rose and on TikTok under the same name. Awesome. And I'll include that in the caption and the show notes as well. So it's easy for people to find, but uh, thank you, Dr. Alexis. I'm so grateful. I love these conversations. They just... Just give me all the joy bubbles. So (laughs) thank you so much for sharing and for letting us have this conversation here for everyone as well.